Neither was deceit found in his mouth. And when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. Okay, so that's the example part. You're going to be reviled. Like, you will not be treated fairly all the time at Cedarview Community Church. What does, how does God's grace work in your life when you know those vaxxers and anti-vaxxers get going at each other on the internet. Do, do you sound like Jesus or do you sound like every, every other idiot that thinks the world needs their opinion on everything political and religious on the internet? How, how do you react? Well, Jesus left an example because what they did to Jesus, in case you didn't know, they came up and they spat in his face. You've probably never had someone do that in the lobby. But that's how they treated him. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. I don't get mad, I just get even. Well, what did he do? He continued entrusting himself to him who judges. There will be judgment for every wrongdoing. It's just that it, that wasn't what Jesus did at that time. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. If, if someone doesn't want to see substitution in that, I, just, I can't help you. He bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin. My pen must be wearing out. And live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. You were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So the, the obvious two thoughts in that great text are, first, that Jesus didn't die for his own sins. Clearly, he died as my substitute. 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. The Bible actually puts the crucifixion in legal terms to emphasize this, where it says Jesus died the just for the unjust. The second thing in this text is his death stimulates a love and a power for righteous living in this present world. 24, that we might die to sin right now, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Or 25, you were all us straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The church used to be more specific and more demonstrative in proclaiming these two um, radical accomplishments of Christ's cross. We were delivered from the just wrath of God against sin. We were empowered for countercultural righteousness. Just this week, I was thinking of how the church readied and prepared thoughtful worshipers around these two victories. 
I cut my teeth singing what now would be regarded as just old relics in most churches. The four Horban boys would stand with mom every Sunday, morning and night, no such thing as supervised nursery and no such thing as children's church. And we would sing, not always with joy in our hearts, songs like, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, Let Me Hide Myself in Thee. And it's right here that just this past week I made a discovery. I took out the hymn book that we usually sing from by uh, mostly some computer program. And I compared it with the old hymn book I actually used to use and grew up with. And you guessed it. Somebody's been messing with the words. Let me quote you the not so subtle difference. Here's the current hymn book. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Nothing wrong with that. that that's what we sing now. I want you to see the subtle difference. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Someone took God's wrath against sin out of that hymn and they robbed the church of something precious. There's that reference, true enough, there's a refuge, reference to being cleansed from guilt, but no mention of just how that guilt is measured. Guilty against whom? Guilty of what? And what if I don't give a hoot about that guilt? There's no mention here about why it matters that I deal with this guilt. Are there any serious consequences if I don't care beans about this guilt? Let me read you a quote. Shaler Matthews, who was dean of the Divinity School at the University of Chicago, this is years ago, had these words of complaint against what he considered the doctrinal irrelevancies of the church. He's a pretty insightful writer. Quote, the world needs new control of nature and society and is told that the Bible is verbally iner inerrant. The world needs a means of composing class strife and is told to believe in substitutionary atonement. It needs a living faith in the divine presence in human affairs, and it's told it must accept the virgin birth of Christ. You can see what he's doing. I mean, these, these words aren't a denial of the event of the cross of Jesus Christ. There's nothing in them to question the truth of what you believe happened when Jesus died. The attack is not on the truth or the doctrine. It's, it's on the relevance. Who cares? The quote is a gigantic shrug of the shoulders. It's saying your beliefs might be true. What difference do they make? Of course, there's a whole side of the relevance question that's ignored completely in that quote. I hope you noticed it. He says, quote, the world needs new control of nature and society and is told that the Bible is verbally inerrant. It needs a means of composing class strife and is told to believe in substitutionary atonement. It needs faith in the divine presence in human affairs and is told it must accept the virgin birth. And as important as all those things are, 
They're taken in the minds of the writer to be the whole of reality. This present earthly realm of concerns is the only thing that religion should address. No mention of sin as guilt before a just and holy God who will come again and judge. No mention of death and the debilitating fear of death. No mention of the reality of the fall, the consistent flow of wickedness that issues from every person everywhere. In fact, Seeing the wickedness this critic lists, you would think spiritual realities, the ones he mocks, would be really hard to ignore. Why, why, is, why are things consistently going so wrong? You'd think someone would say, there's obviously a bigger issue here that needs to be dealt with. I mean, it's like, it's like flipping a quarter six billion times and having it come up heads every time. Why is it always going wrong in this world? That's the question Christianity addresses. We need to have an honest response. What relevant difference does the cross make? Does it change anything right now? And here, our text, our text has a voice. And it's a rather shocking verdict that not only does the cross of Christ have a shaping power in the transformation of our lives presently in this world, but our text presses far beyond that. Peter actually says only the justifying work of Christ Jesus on the cross has power to effect permanent radical change in the human heart. That there is no other solution. The doctrines that Shaler says are irrelevant are the only ones that can possibly answer to the deepest human need, only he doesn't see it. Point number one. Strangely, Peter ties together, citing Christ as our example, with an emphasis on something Christ accomplished that can never be copied. Like, that seems contradictory. Look at 1 Peter 1, 21 and then 24. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you. Now, here, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. And then he says in 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. He says, he himself, that's Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree. Now, to say that we need to pause here is an understatement. Peter does what we would almost never do in calling someone to follow a good example. I mean, if you're calling a student to follow the example of a great person, you pick something in the person that you honestly believe the student can imitate. That's the whole purpose of an example, right? After all, you're not trying to discourage the student. You're trying to motivate him or her to a higher standard. In essence, you're saying, look, he did it, you can do it. That's what an example's for. So before we go too far with our text, we need to ask the right questions. It's always a good way to do Bible study. And the question we need to ask in this text is what is Peter trying to do for us here? Because, because if he's calling us to be like Jesus, which he does, he suffered leaving you an example 21. So if he's calling us to be like Jesus and yet insists on telling us how absolutely unique Jesus is, he committed no sin, 22. He bore our sins in his own body, 24. Then, okay, wait a minute. So Peter is using Jesus as an example, but not merely an example because he talks about things Jesus did that no one in this room can do. How are we supposed to put that together?
Before we drift too far down the road, remember our opening critic's objection. Shaler Matthews voiced the thoughts of a lot of people when he said the world needs new control of nature and society, and it's told that the Bible is verbally inerrant. It needs a means of composing, solving class strife, and is told to believe in substitutionary atonement. It needs divine presence in human affairs, and it's told to accept the virgin birth. So that's the objection we're examining in light of our first Peter text. And Peter says we need something bigger and more radical than just another bit of advice. Advice isn't going to fix this. The same old methods of reforming society haven't worked yet. We have police, we have education, we have universities, we have politicians, we have doctors, we have everything we can possibly think of to fix all the things that are wrong with society, and they're all still wrong with society. So clearly, we need more than a natural approach. We need more than just another example. And as we've seen, looking at Peter's argument, he doesn't just tell us to try and be a bit more like Jesus. Yes, yes, there's an example there, all right. But Peter enlists the example only, only after he's pointed out the unique redeeming work of Christ bearing our sins in his body on the tree. So here's what I'm saying. The example only has meaning following the substitutionary death of Jesus on the cross. You can't just slap on a what would Jesus do bracelet and change the world. It won't work. It won't work. Paul makes the same point as Peter. Work out your own salvation. There it is, with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. So this really is two, if you are numbering. This is one down here. You're, you're able to work out your salvation because of what was accomplished on the cross through the death of Christ. Just the example won't do it. The example requires new life to follow the example, and that comes only through the cross. We'd be doomed to failure if our working out all of the things of salvation if that was our hope of salvation, we'd never make it. We were able to work these things out only through and because of and the enabling within. So here's our answer to Shaler's first objection. The gospel of the cross, at least properly understood, is never presented as a dodge to personal transformation, but as the only genuine root and hope. But there's more here, point number two. Because of the nature of Christ's saving work, to profess trust in him is to follow him. You can see it in 21 and then in 24 to 25 of our text. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. So here, this is atonement, right? This is forgiveness. This is grace. What happens with grace? Well, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. We might die to sin, live to righteousness. This is one, this is two. By his wounds you have been healed. That's the forgiveness, the transformation. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So clearly, 
An example has been left, 24, how shall we keep it? How will we keep it? How shall our old lives be torn away from their creaky hinges and a new way of living be set in place? Because that's what we need if we're going to follow the example of Jesus. I can't do it on my own. You can't either. Or perhaps the right question to ask is, what is it that keeps us from following the best examples that we have? Any example. We've had many. Most of us have had teachers, parents, great books, authors, examples from history, friends with noble character. I mean, surely no honest person can claim his moral failure on just, well, it's a lack of information. We know that's not the problem. But our sin does seem to be a problem. There's always that gap between what we know and what we may occasionally wish for and that ugly monster inside that constantly pushes the buttons of self, pride, greed. Our inward desires tear down the best examples we can find. But what if we, what if we could be healed? What if we could be healed? What if someone came alongside and said, Don, you, you are now free to soar where you never could soar before with all the best efforts you could muster because, Don, you've been healed. What if the healing were as real, literal, as someone who was dying of cancer and bang, not a trace, and they lived to their 102 what if this healing, what if this healing, now inwardly, what if it's as real as that, as actual as that? What if, what if the death of Christ actually can work like that? We don't follow, please get this, we don't follow the shepherd in order to qualify. We follow the shepherd because we have been already healed and enabled. We don't follow the example to bring our healing. That would never work. We follow because we have been healed by the only power that could ever make our following possible. So, hear this. It might be freeing for you. The call to discipleship is never just a call to shape up. It is a call to follow the example of Christ, but it's based on the substitutionary atonement of Christ and its healing work in my heart. Point number three. Before you say you've placed your trust in the cross of Jesus Christ, Make sure you hear Peter out. 20 to 23. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? In other words, you've, you've, you've brought your trouble on yourself with your own wickedness and you endure the punishment. Well, you don't, there's no credit there. That's the least you can do. But if when, if when you do good and suffer for it, the it, by the way, is the good. If then you endure, this is, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But this is an interesting phrase, continued entrusting himself to him who judges. Did you know God judges? to him who judges 
justly. Here's the thing about faith for all of us. It originates inside me. Let's talk about my faith. I can say that I have faith in Jesus and I can say that I don't have faith in Jesus. And either way, you have to take my word for it. If I were sneaky, I could get up here and preach sermons and not believe a word of what I'm saying. You wouldn't know. That does happen in Christian leadership sometimes. I could go to church. I could know when to bow my head. I know when Tom's leading and he wants us to raise our hands and worship. I can shut my eyes. I can learn Bible verses. I can put large sums of money in an offering plate and do all of it with no inward devotion to Christ whatsoever. So Peter, as he addresses this subject of being 24 healed, by Christ's death, and returning to him, 25, as the overseer, being healed and returning to him. He doesn't just leave those ideas lying lifelessly on the floor. He draws attention to the nature of faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord by comparing it to another manifestation of great faith and trust in God. And he picks Jesus. And he says, if you've been healed through the power of the atonement and you're returning, because we were all like sheep, all of us, going our own way, returning now to the overseer of our souls, that's what he calls the Lord. If that's happening, what will that faith look like? And that's where this example comes in. And he draws attention to the faith of Jesus. I said it, the faith of Jesus, because the text talks about that. And here's where Peter's going. Everybody experiences mistreatment. Everybody. Now, we don't experience it to the degree that Jesus experienced it in his suffering, because he was absolutely sinless, blameless. I'm not. You might be close, but you're not. In other words, a lot of the suffering that we experience is our own fault, <laughs> okay? But when he's looking at this example, he specifically wants to deal with the things we suffer that aren't our fault, and that's why he talks about Jesus. Because nothing that he experienced in terms of the persecution and suffering, none of it was deserved. And so Peter says, Don, if you've experienced the life of Christ in you, Here's what it should look like when you are mistreated. It should look like Jesus looked like when he was mistreated, Don. There's your example. In fact, he used the word calling. This is your calling. Whatever happens, anytime, anywhere, to you, online, in person. We tend to be a lot meaner to people online than in person. That's a serious problem. But whenever that happens, anytime, anywhere, what's being assaulted and tested is not your personality, not your rights. That's where our heads tend to go. What's being tested when you're mistreated is not your rights. What's being tested is your faith in Jesus and whether you're following him. Is that up on the screen? 223? Read it out loud with me, okay? When he was reviled, he did not revile in turn. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. See that word entrusting? You see trust in it? That's, that's the faith. That's the faith of Jesus. He put faith in him. This is Father God who judges justly. I don't have to deal with 
the mistreatment I receive from people. In fact, I'm told not to, and I'm specifically told not to because, not because it doesn't matter. If, if Chris badly mistreats me, I don't have to strike back at Chris, not because I'm just a wonderful human being, true enough, but because one way or another, God will deal with that. This is Jesus. Yes, Jesus, exercising faith in trusting. Jesus knew that God would judge all wrongdoers. He didn't have to strike back or strike out because God would exercise strong judgment against the guilty. Paul says exactly the same thing. This is not a novel thought. It just doesn't get talked about much. Here's the same idea. Repay no one evil for evil. That's Peter, right? Same thing. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as far as depends on you, live peaceable with all, beloved. Never avenge yourselves. Why? Leave it to the wrath of God. There's the W word. You can take it out of the hymn, but you can't take it out of the Bible. Leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And so Peter relates this example of faith to us. Entrust yourself. Have faith in the justice of Father God, just as Jesus himself did. In congregations of all sizes and stripes, in offices across the country, in schools, in marriages, especially in marriages, we are forced to navigate situations where we have an ideal picture of how we should be treated and someone else has a different set of expectations as to how we should be treated by them. It's a common experience of life. And right there, Peter would say, right there, in the painful world that Shayla was writing about, in the painful world of our fractured dreams and our stomped on rights, this is the place where our trust in Christ ceases to be just talk and doctrine. It ceases to be invisible. You'll know if I have faith in Christ by how I react when I'm mistreated by someone. You'll see it. And to the degree that I exercise my own rights, to the degree that I beef up my own self-defense, to the degree that I practice the opposite of the example of Jesus Christ, you have the right to say to me, Don, I think your Christianity is all talk. It's like, I don't think it's the real deal. Because Peter says, Don, this is your calling in this world. Did you know that? What is God calling you to? Missionary to Indonesia. Well, that's good. But there's another calling that everyone in this room has. Here's what it is. You're called to respond lovingly and graciously like Jesus when people te treat you like dirt. That's your calling. That's your calling. So let's not lift up our hands when they lead and sing about, I've decided to follow Jesus unless this is going to start to shine. You see it, churches split, staff split, people fight and squawk. When Christians don't get their way, they're just like everyone else. That's the complaint I hear. We simply must get Peter's most urgent idea. He's not talking about two different faiths when he links up following Christ as our example and trusting in Christ as our redeemer. He's telling us what it looks like when we've been healed by the atoning work of Jesus Christ. He's telling us what that looks like. How can I say I trust him with my sins? Not sure I trust him with my rights. <laughs> because he's he's the one and only Lord of all. No wonder when Peter talks about faith in Christ and his cross, 
when he seeks to reveal the unbelievable, hope-filled power of the atonement, he says it brings healing to the most cherished, sensitive, deeply rooted area of my inner life, my rights. And that, Shaler Matthews, is the most relevant gospel in the whole world. In fact, it's absolutely unique. And everyone said, we are just so grateful that we never move beyond the place where your word still humbles us. It's been teaching your word for 40 years in this church and passages like this, they just humble me. They make me feel small. They make, I'm sure, they make all of us wanna just come back again to the feet of Jesus, grab both the feet of Jesus, right? The foot of the cross and say, just, just don't give up on me. Just keep working in me, Holy Spirit. Just keep working in me, Holy Spirit. And we'll know when that's happening. When someone expresses demonic hatred toward us and we respond online and off with the love and grace of Jesus because because he lives in our hearts all the time. He lives there full time. Continue to do that work, I pray in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen.